All right, we're back. Build 2013, Channel 9 Live. Very happy to have John Chuchuk with us. Uh, it's been a while since we've had you on Channel 9, man. Yeah. Like, uh, like maybe 12 years, 10 years? Is it that long? I think it is, man. Wow. Look at the grays. Yes. Yeah, right on. So you're a technical fellow. Yep. Um, and we just had a technical fellow on here. Thanks for all the great questions with Anders. What have you been up to in, say, the past, I don't know, 10 years? Well, most recently. Most recently. I was working on... Um, on uh, Active Directory, and okay. we just, it was very exciting today to see the announcements around Active Directory. All that stuff Scott Guthrie showed with the, uh, with the ability to release um, identity for organizations and then to do the SaaS, SaaS management, um, mm -hmm. hooking up all those apps. Uh, that's all stuff that comes out of that Active Directory world. Awesome. So, yeah, a couple months ago, well, back in December, actually, I was talking to Mr. Bomber about what should I go do next? <laughs> and he, uh, he said, hey, it, I got this gig I want you to try. I want you to go over, hang out with the DPE guys and help build a, the technical team up and interface with developers and get the conversation going better back and forth. Awesome, which is a great thing for a technical fellow to do. Yeah. Now a technical fellow, for the people out there who don't know, is the highest you can get. I guess unless you're Dave Cutler, who's a senior technical Yeah, fellow. double technical Double, fellow, yeah. but of course it's him. Um, then again... Uh, he invent NT and modern little operating things like systems. That. It's probably worth it. Yeah, Hypervisors yeah. for yeah, Xbox One. Xbox, there's yeah. the triumvirate operating system, which is quite interesting. So I kind of want to ask you, uh, by the way, everybody who's watching, you see the little boxes underneath where you're watching me talk now? Type questions in there. When we'll get an answer from uh, John here. He's... Uh, got a wide expertise, so you can probably ask questions about .NET, Active Directory, WCF, you name it, Internet Explorer. Let's, let's put this guy on the spot. I mean, you know a lot about a lot of this technology because you worked on those. Yep. Um, and .NET was something I know you worked on from the very beginning. Yep. Back when it was called, I don't even know what it was called, NWI, whatever. Yeah. yeah. What, yeah. Remember and, those days? Yeah, we had some crazy <laughs> name for it. Became .NET 1.0, that was fun. Totally. Right on, man. So, websites. Yes. Versus apps. Yes. Versus. Well, talk to me about, like, is a website an app? Well, Look, how do you think about this? So, clearly, websites today have evolved to become very sophisticated. Mm. Um, you know, the, in the old world where you would download a page and then there would be a form and then you'd post it back, the app really kind of spanned the client, the server, but a lot of the logic was up on the server. Now with JavaScript and the ability to do very sophisticated processing down on within the browser, uh, the ability to do offline, the ability to do rich presentation, the ability to reach out uh, through Ajax and all of the modern libraries. I mean, we're really doing sophisticated applications now mm. in HTML5 and JavaScript. So yeah, websites have become apps in most cases, well, in many cases, I should say. Okay. There's still simple things out there, but they become very sophisticated. So let me ask a question in the sense that on our platform where we have native HTML5, um, what, what is the difference? So for example, if you're, if you're running in a web browser, yep. that essentially is a virtual machine. Yes. Um, whereas in the other world, which is you're running right on the lower operating system, right? Talk to us a little bit about that differentiation and how far away is a website from an HTML5 Windows Store app? Yeah, I think sometimes people mix together the, nation, the notion of native and the notion of the app experience that people have become familiar with on Windows 8, on Android, on, on iOS. Um, so let's kind of tease that apart. Mm. Clearly, there's the ability to go down and write the instructions that the processor itself knows how to go execute. And that's often what people mean by native. Okay. Um, and that's a great way to write code. We did a demo a little while ago in our keynote where we showed people taking advantage directly down to the metal with C and C++ and talking to the GPUs and doing some augmented reality. And yes. We love that model. We support that across all our devices, and we love those kind of native applications. Okay. Now, even native applications, there's often things like virtual machines around, like on Xbox, which are providing services and may provide a little bit of indirection, but you're mostly going directly to the, to the, to the processor. 
Now, as you move up to things like .NET or to JavaScript, we take additional engines that provide uh, capabilities in terms of middleware, or libraries, other kinds of things to help the developer get their job done. But from the perspective of creating an app that feels like an app that's native mm -hmm. in the platform, you could write that in anything. You could write that in C, you could write that in .NET, you could write that in HTML5 and JavaScript. Mm -hmm. And one of the great things about the Windows platform is we let all of those options show through and people can do a great job building apps in all of those environments. And maybe even you know, what we know from actually looking at the store data is that many people mix and match. Mm. So they'll use a bunch of web, and then they'll use a bunch of .NET. Sometimes mm. they'll even throw some C in there. Mm. Um, I've done those demos. I've put together apps that work that way. Sure. Um, so kind of, you have to be a little bit careful when you use that term native. Absolutely. Yeah. Make sense? It does make sense. I mean, and the thing is, like, we do support multiple, very wildly different runtimes and programming models. And that you will see people mix and match two garbage collected runtimes with the reference counted runtime underneath if you're using like C++ CX, you still have to think through. Not everybody's a technical fellow. You need to think through, wait a minute, I'm going to have some cycle problems here if I, you know, blah, blah, blah. Let's talk about like the things we the have The performance? To... Yes. Ah, so performance is a, it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we've been doing a lot of work with both IE and with the new version of Visual Studio is to give people great performance tools so they can kind of see what's going on. But the thing I would say is when we've looked at these applications, um, we often see people taking great advantage of the web technologies we've made in 8.1. We've made significant advances in our ability to efficiently process web technologies. In fact, that new web view control that yeah. everybody's pretty excited yes. about because it's all built on that common engine that's processing the HTML5 and JavaScript, performance has gone way up. Cool. And so, again, you go back to this question people have had about should I build a website or should I build an app? Mm. Um, one of the reasons that sometimes people switched languages when they moved away from their website and they were going to go build an app on something like iOS and Android is sometimes they had lower performance. Okay. So, a combination of the work the industry is doing around browser technologies, um, a combination of being careful about how you go build your app, really opens up a lot of doors for how people can choose to use their app. And the thing I, I always kind of keep in mind is that these machines, they get faster and faster every year. Mm. Um, and so I think if we were to play the clock forward, say, five years, I think a lot of the debate will tend to diminish. I mean, I can, I remember when people would argue with me about, look, uh, assembly language. Anybody who's doing <laughs> real apps, they're going to write it in assembly language. And all that compiler stuff is crazy. Um, and there are still parts of the operating systems or games where you may want to go do some hand tuning in assembly language. Uh, but times move on. Uh, yep. Runtimes get better, compilers get faster, um, and all that productivity that we get out of that lets people do new and exciting things. So, you know, try. I often recommend to people that they they kind of think ahead a couple of steps when they're making their choices because you follow the trends. I mean, I don't think anybody would have predicted mm. when we came out with you know early versions of the browsers mm. that we would be where we are today in terms of JavaScript performance, the richness of the libraries, the set of capabilities people are doing on the totally. web today. It's incredible. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So we have a question from Christopher Anderson wants to know, is Windows Azure Active Directory powered by Active Directory lightweight directory service? So that's a great question. Um, in a way, yes. but. That would be maybe stretching it a little too much. Um, so look, it, there's a common set of, of code that we have running across Windows Server um, with ADLDS and with Active Directory Server itself. But what we've done in the cloud, the cloud is actually a much more sophisticated architecture where we're using lots of different pieces of that technology stack often across multiple data centers. Mm. Um, that's how we ensure things like high availability. So yeah, those technology components are in there, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not like 
it's just that executable, and we put a couple copies up and ran them in VMs and said, hey, there you go, everybody, Azure Active Directory in the cloud. Wow. It's been a major undertaking. I'm sure. Um, tremendous developers across the Active Directory team uh, mm -hmm. putting that stuff together. Uh, and there are many different teams that are putting together the different services. There's a core directory team, uh, Anandi, uh, great developer, she runs that team. Uh, there's another team that's running the, the, the protocol processing pieces that do things like the, the OAuth protocol. Mm. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty significant effort across a lot of people uh, putting that together. Super exciting to see the work that we did uh, in Satya's announcement that Scott showed where uh, people are able to take Active Directory quickly and easily, add it to Azure websites, Awesome. Uh, and then the stuff with, uh, with Aaron and Box and our ability to do SaaS management, boy, that's just super exciting to see. Awesome, man. Yeah. Uh, Dominic wants to know, how well is PHP supported in VS 2013? Uh, can one use it without ASP.NET? That might be, I mean, how do you? I don't know the answer <laughs> to that one. Um, so I can answer the second part. Can you use it without ASP.NET? Um, so there's, there's the tools question, which is the first part of that. Sure. I haven't actually used the tool support for PHP. Okay. In terms of, do you have to use ASP.NET and Azure, mobile we Azure websites? Mm -hmm. No, you could actually just spin up a Unix environment and use whatever you'd like to use. Uh, that's the beauty of the new IaaS capabilities that totally. we're providing, so. Okay, excellent. Um, where do you see the .NET framework heading for maybe five years now down the line? This actually brings up a great Uber topic to discuss. Yes. Dot net. Dot net. Now, there seems to have been some sort of, uh, you know, interesting momentum, if you will, over the past couple of years. And I know you're, a, a, having been part of the creation of dot net, a big fan of dot net. Love dot net. So talk yeah. to, that's a great question. What, where do you think, where, where is dot net today? Where is it going, man? So, I mean, the thing about dot net was, you know, when dot net came out, uh, it really was pretty transformational for development on top of the Windows platform. Uh, having a modern managed runtime across client and server, a rich set of libraries, really increased developer productivity quite a bit. And you know, we never, there was never an intent to say .NET was the only Microsoft programming model, but the productivity benefits to a lot of people meant that .NET became a very central point of focus for a broad collection of developers. Um, Win32 and native development continued to be really important. There were a lot of tremendously powerful, very good apps that were built in C down to the more direct Win32 APIs. But I think in the, in the, com the broader conversation, there was kind of this view that .NET was the API as That's opposed it. to part of the family of APIs. Okay. As we fast forward today, we still see that same kind of thing going on, which is Microsoft continues to support multiple development environments. We continue to support the C, C++, DX, native style coding. We continue to support .NET style coding. And we've added this new thing, which is the HTML and, HTML and JavaScript style yeah. coding. Uh, we view all of those as great ways to go build apps, um, both amazingly enough on the client as well as on the server. I think maybe the, the web and, and JavaScript on the server is maybe one of the biggest surprises to people with things like Node.js sure. and our support for that. All right, so you got all of these different environments. We're back to the .NET one. What about .NET? It's yeah. .NET, I have hear people say, oh, you guys think .NET's dead. I, I, I find that a kind of funny conversation because if you look, .NET is everywhere. Mm -hmm. .NET's on our server, it's our premier server environment. Our languages, our runtimes, our libraries up there are fantastic. We continue to invest incredibly heavily in it. We've got .NET across our devices. Mm -hmm. um, now, as I said in the keynote, the yeah. thing that I think sometimes confuses people when they have the .NET conversation is they're like, well, it isn't the only answer anymore because people I think mistakenly had this view that it was kind of the only main one. And so when they see the emergence of these other programming environments, they get worried. Yep. They shouldn't worry about that. We love .NET, we're gonna keep supporting it. They also worry that if their favorite 
library in .NET isn't available on all the different devices, that somehow that might mean we're going to walk away from it. Mm -hmm. And probably the one that people are most vocal about is WPF. Yeah. Um, they say, hey, with Windows 8, you guys are definitely backing off WPF, and there's a new way to go build apps. I often point out to them, you know, we don't have WPF up on the phone. And WPF on the Xbox, I'm not sure that that makes sense either. Mm. So as the devices split into these different categories, we need to look at what technologies make sense there. Clearly, clearly we love XAML. Sure. And we think XAML's a fantastic way to do the layouts in .NET. We continue to support that across all of our devices. Um, so as I look ahead for .NET, I mm. think it's got an incredibly rosy future. Awesome. Um, we'll continue to invest heavily in it and uh, we'll continue to invest in the libraries. And the, the programming models that we have supported on our devices today, that's going to be something we keep doing. Absolutely. And you know, that is an interesting topic, because if you look at what the C-sharp and VB teams are doing, they, they're working on Roslyn. Like they're rewriting their compiler infrastructure to be written in .NET and C-sharp and VB. So it's like there is. They have good insight into where things are yes, likely going to go. So, so it's a, a good example of right making on, the bet. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So Shooter, another question that might be, I don't know, you probably should know this, but when, when can we have custom login logout pages for Office 365, Windows Azure, Active Directory? I can't give you any dates, but definitely something we're, gonna, we're working on. Awesome. Uh, Zippy V, nice to see you again, man. Will you just get up? Uh, will we see a unified environment between phone, tablet, and PC where one app works on all of them without any modification? No, we're not showing that here at Build today. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I suspect he's asking about in the future. Yes. Um, and uh, as we kind of look ahead, it's clear that we're making progress toward the common core mm -hmm. um, with with Xbox being on Windows 8, the kernel uh, for the part of the operating system that does a lot of the user interactivity, not the high performance, mm -hmm. low level gaming por portion of it, with the phone, with what we're doing around 8. Getting that common kernel in place really gives us a lot of, of capability to really bring things together. And that, that's something that takes time. Yep. Um, it's certainly something where we'll, we'll work toward having okay. more and more common capability. Now, the single app point is an mm. interesting one, because I have my doubts about whether it makes sense to have exactly the same app on all the devices. When I look at the differences in sizes, input devices, um, the interaction model that exists, like just take Xbox concretely with the Kinect and the, the NUI, and then I compare that to the keyboard, mouse, and touch environment of Windows. You know, we've done experiments in the labs, and we've tried out, hey, can we make them exactly the same? I think we'll end up with differences between devices. Absolutely. And I mean, and but there's I'm nothing not, wrong with that. Yeah, I'm not making any, that, that's not a, who knows, we, could, we reserve the right totally. to get smarter. Let's Absolutely. put it that way. But that's a little insight into where we might be going. Right on, man. Thank you. Good question, okay. Zippy V. Uh, Suresh wants to know, any plan to bring Visual Studio services like TFS services in the visuals? future. So we have, I'm not sure what that's asking. We have TFS in the cloud. <laughs> we do. I love TFS in the cloud. So on my new team, I've got a lot of developers and we do a lot of projects both with people inside of Microsoft okay. um, as well as lots of development partners where we're helping people build apps and we're working with third parties often in combination. We love putting that stuff in TFS. I love the Git support. Nice. Um, it lets everybody do it. The fact that you can push out to things like CodePlex or GitHub, beautiful kind of thing. Uh, and to the, to the question, yeah. Visual Studio has great support for TFS yeah. in the cloud, and it's got great support for Git. So I, I, I'm not sure what the question was, yeah. but I think we're, we're doing stuff. Right on, man. And right it's on. good. Anthony wants to know, would Microsoft consider making all Windows software operating system platforms and future software development cloud-based, like Windows Azure for robust stability? That's a great question. Um, so kind of there's two levels to that question. One is kind of at an architectural level, and then there's the product packaging level. Mm. Um, certainly on the STP side of the house in Satya's organization, we're kind of doing what he's saying. We've 
for a long time when we wrote software, we designed for servers, and then we thought about how we could take those servers up and make cloud services. We don't do that anymore. We design for the cloud design point architecturally. We design multi-tenant software. We design software that has the highest level of internet scale, the, that automatic robustness and reliability that comes out of it. And then we're take, over time, what we've been doing is as we get that stuff solidified in the cloud, we're taking those features back and we're packaging it into products. Hmm. And so from an architectural standpoint, I think we're doing exactly what he's talked about. Okay. Um, then there's the open question about what gets packaged and distributed. You know, there's some services that we do in the cloud that I just, I'm not sure they're gonna ever make sense to package up and put as a turnkey product. Take the, the entirety of the Bing platform. Mm. All of that knowledge, all of the crawling, all of the analytics and machine learning, I'm not sure that we want a single box that does that. Now we may take parts of that, mm -hmm. we could have an on-premise automatic cloud search service, mm. um, but I don't think that there's a one-size-fits-all plan Absolutely. for packaging. So Paul wants to know, what is your opinion on Node.js as a server-side programming platform? I love Node. All right. So uh, Node's one of my favorite languages to program in with, with one little nuance. Okay. I like adding TypeScript into the mix. Nice. So I, I've, I think the <laughs> world of TypeScript. Cool. I think it's just such a fun, such a cool language. Mm. If I had my choice of like doing most of my development, mm. um, I love the combination of TypeScript because I get the, the commonality of that language on the client, on the server. I love what TypeScript gives me in terms of the, the common structuring. Um, totally. It's just awesome. Right I think on. that those guys are doing fantastic work. So yes, I love Node.js. I love that execution environment. Fantastic work there. Mm -hmm. Add a little TypeScript into it and it's even more fun. Awesome. Uh, with the onset of things like Web API and WebSockets, where do you see WCF in the next few years? Yeah, it's interesting. WCF, fun project. Uh, got to work on that. Um, one of the things that we've seen is just, obviously the web's really taken off. Mm. And we wrote WCF in a world where the degree of ubiquity associated with the web that we see today was emergent. It okay. was just kind of starting. And at the time we built WCF, there was a lot of debate about you know, the kinds of protocols people would want to create and the ability to have protocol agility. Mm -hmm. um, we partnered with a lot of big companies. We were pretty targeted at, for example, making sure we had good interop with IBM. And so to cover all of the different legacy protocols and all of the different ways that people might want to construct things, we kind of designed this whole WS star protocol. Mm -hmm. And WCF was tuned to be able to support WS star as well as many other protocols. And we've seen great success. Mm. WCF is used very extensively throughout Microsoft. But I will say this, all of that flexibility and capability comes with the cost. Mm -hmm. um, it comes in a cost of complexity and, and it has a learning curve. Now, what's happened since then is that in many ways the web has become the lingua franca, if you will, of interoperability and communications. Now we do see some emergence of things like WebSockets and mm -hmm. additional ways that people are starting to communicate because they've started to encounter some of the limitations that the pure request response model. Um, so with, with things like the ASP.NET Web API, uh, I think we've given people a fantastic way to get going quickly with the web protocols and with things like WebSockets emerging to provide more uh, real-time interactivity. That sure. whole world is emerging into a very rich place to do communications. I think you can cover many of the scenarios mm -hmm. that you did with WCF with some of these new technologies. I don't think all of them get covered. Sure. Um, so it's great to have both the high, uh, the great new capabilities as well as the old stuff. Um, one other quick point on that. Yeah. You know, we um, when we wrote a lot of the WS Star protocols, we took a lot of those ideas and we moved them to web protocols. Mm. Uh, a great example of this is, um, is OAuth 2. Okay. A lot of the thinking and learnings that had gone into WS Star, we moved to pretty straightforward web protocols, and boy, has that taken off like wildfire. Mm. Um, so, just interesting to see how these things evolve. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Um, and they have to evolve in the context of the real world. Yes, how what's the, happening, cross-vendor. 
and there's been so tremendous amounts of changes. And the thing that I find really interesting is that I remember the smart client Drips. days. Hold on. Oops, you're right. Mad, yeah. Mad water. Remember the smart client days? Mm -hmm. I mean, I was in DPE back when that was like the mantra where we would have these wind form clients, they'd interoperate with the web. We oh, yeah, yeah. Read them, and it was like, it seems like we're back there again. We're just not we calling are. them smart clients. Yeah, well, there's smart clients and there's web clients, and now web clients are smart clients. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Everything goes round. Everything's round, man. Yeah. So Freeman wants to know, this is back to uh, Active, Active Directory. Directory again. What is which the future is convenient. of so, ADFS? Um, so ADFS, I, just for people who don't necessarily know, is the, AD is a lot of pieces. Um, there's a core directory. There's a part of Active Directory that is a, a component that provides integration with third-party identity providers. Typically, companies deploy it on the edge of their firewall, and it allows uh, two companies to create applications that talk together and their, their identities can flow across. So that server is part of AD. Um, it's a role that can be deployed independently. Mm. Um, it's not going away. Uh, okay. We continue to love ADFS. It's going to continue to get better. Um, what we also have seen is that as we've moved to the cloud, that capability that is in ADFS has become much more important. Mm. And it's become very central. And so a lot of the ideas that were in there have been incorporated into things like the access control service that's part of the AD in the cloud. Um, we're moving to a, a really a what I think of as a very beautiful next generation architecture up in the cloud uh, where much of the identity and federation capability are moving to a common code base nice. up in the cloud. All part of Active Directory, so this is a little bit kind of behind the scenes sausage factory stuff. Mm -hmm. From your perspective as a developer, what you just see is a bunch of endpoints, you talk to them, it all works. Mm. Um, so I guess the short answer is what's going to happen to ADFS, so I think we'll I think we'll continue to improve what we've got on-prem. I think you'll see a lot of innovation awesome. continue to occur, especially as we've moved to this new code base up in the cloud. Excellent. So Bo Eli Bob wants to know, will .NET continue to be distanced from calling directly into DirectX, i.e. being required to go through the XAML yeah, rendering yeah. engine? So I've gotten this question, I got this question earlier today. I actually don't know the answer to this one. Okay. Um, I will find out. Um, I don't know if there's a good way for me to get that information back to your, sure. to your team. But um, I mean, isn't there, is there, isn't there Sharp DX? Isn't there a I, I wrapper? Actually, I don't know. Okay, so there. So I haven't played with this, so. Fair enough, but there is Sharp DX. If you're a .NET developer, someone already wrote a pretty high performance wrapper oh, okay. for you. Um, and that's something to check out, I realize. Yeah. I just but, saw Chris Anderson walking down the hall. Yeah. So, and I was saying we got to catch up, so I will follow right up. Right on, with him. man. Okay. Right on. All right. So, what level of functional programming support will Microsoft provide for new developers? Will we have new features shown at BuildConf? I don't know. Right on. Uh, so we're getting into some stuff. You know, ask me about AD, and I'm usually pretty good. No, that's okay. fine. I mean, that's all right. In .NET 4.5, peer channel was deprecated. What will replace it? Ed, so this is an interesting one. We um, we definitely think that the scenarios where people are able to communicate more effectively peer to peer okay. are are really key. Um, I actually just brought a really top notch guy onto my team who's super interested in this particular topic. Okay. Um, I don't have anything to announce at this point in sure. time, but okay. um, it's an area that we we are investing in and want to continue. Uh, especially in light of all of the, the excitement that's uh, in the world today around privacy. And um, I know sometimes people worry about this, particularly on an individual basis, yeah. but that set of capabilities I view as critical for mm. everyone. I sure. think you, know, you take an organization, they need to be able to operate in a way that their competitors or others don't, aren't able to do traffic analysis and understand how they're communicating. Mm -hmm. so, Having a rich toolbox of capabilities at people's disposal, I think, is important and enables a lot of scenarios. Absolutely. So Puppy wants to know, oh, this is a... Uh, well, a Roslyn-style C++. Uh, I can answer that. The answer to that will be, let's save that question for Friday. Friday. Going native live. We'll have Tarek Madker here. We'll have some back-end compiler guys from the C++ team. We'll let them answer that question. Um, but that's obviously an interesting thing. 
to be able okay. to program C++ compiler as a service. It's a little bit more work than the .NET ones, but we'll let the C++ people talk about that. Yeah, this whole idea what of do you think providing build capabilities up in the cloud is a pretty cool thing. Um, you know, we were talking about this web. Yes. And web versus app. You know, one of the things that um, a couple guys on my team have been toying around with. We're not shipping a product here. This is not a product announcement. This is just something we're doing in the labs. Is um, making it so that we could just extrude, just generate in the cloud an app uh, based on a website. So you have website X. You got website you X. Button. You go up to the cloud. You say, hey, <laughs> here's the URL for the website, and it gives you back an app. A client app. Yeah. That you would run on, like, Windows, Windows 8, 8, Windows, Windows 8 Phone. Yeah. Nice. Excellent. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that kind of cool stuff where the cloud provides development capabilities. I mean, you've already seen some of the great work we've been doing around cloud-based editors. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you noticed this up in the, uh, up in the keynote. Um, as Scott Guthrie was typing, I don't know, Scott Hanselman was typing in up there. Uh -huh. um, Maybe it wasn't even Scott, but during Satya's keynote, okay. they were typing in some JavaScript up on the client, and it was syntax highlighting. Okay, nice. So I just think there's a lot, a lot of stuff we can do up in the cloud to make life better for developers. Amen to that. And on that note, thank you for coming on oh, Shell 9 Live. Are we done? We're done. We're going okay. to wind down because the way this works is we'll have uh, another one coming up here. And I want to thank all of you for your excellent questions and especially thank hey, you. Hey, I really on. enjoyed it. I hope we can do this again sometime. Yeah, looking right forward on. to it. Take care.